well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for attending uh, today's webinar. Today, we will be going over film and identification and microanalysis techniques. My name is Tyler Benz. I'm one of the three technical service reps here at Aquafix. I'm joined today with... I'm Natalie. I'm the lead microscopist. My name is Sailor. I'm a research scientist. Like I said, today, we'll be going over microanalysis and film and identification. Just a little bit for those who aren't familiar with Aquafix. We're a wastewater lab out of Madison, Wisconsin, where we specialize in microanalysis, film and identification, consulting, and ultimately bioaugmentation treatments for wastewater ailments and issues. Today's webinar is going to brush over and cover the importance of performing routine microscopic analysis, how to conduct that analysis, as well as an overview of the characteristics of flocculated bacteria, metazoa, protozoa, filaments, and then the combined significance of your microbiology. And if you're new to this format, how it works is the three of us will give a brief presentation. And if any time during our slides, you have a question, feel free to shoot that in the chat and we'll address that when we get the chance. Otherwise, our presentation hopefully will stir up some questions and the end is open to you. So starting out, why is microscopy important? Whether you have issues or not, it's important to do microscopy because you need to establish that baseline health. If you have your baseline health established, you can see if you're going to have future issues or not because you can see a difference from your normal biology. It's important to have that baseline because your plant may be running just fine, but microscopically, it may look like it's ha having issues, but that's just what works for your plant. It's why you can determine if your plant is running optimally or not. And also, if you're doing treatment, microscopy is a good way to see if th that treatment's working or if you need to make any changes. So how do we do this? We look for microbial indicators. I will be touching on them a little bit more later, but what microbial indicators can tell us is if your system has a high sludge age, nutrient imbalances, low DO, foaming bulking, if toxicity is present, not the kind of toxicity or the amount, but if it's there, and if there are any mechanical issues present. We should be having a pool popping up in a moment. Do you perform microscopy on site? Getting a lot of yeses, that's good to see. Good, about 75% of you, that's, that's good to hear. For those of you who don't have the ability to, but want to, or just don't, the tools that are commonly used for analysis are gonna be a microscope, and then we have our pipetter with just the glass slides and cover slip, as well as an India ink stain and gram and either staining. So let's talk about indicators and just kind of what we're looking at underneath the microscope. So we'll start out with flock. Flock, you are gonna be looking for the average size, the average shape and the structure. Your ideal flock are going to be on the smaller end of medium. They're going to be an even mixture between a regular and spherical, and they're going to be a kind of lightly condensed, but not super condensed because that's when you'll get issues. Those issues can be tied to the phase contrast under oxygen penetration. So when you're looking under phase contrast at flock, you typically want your flock to be white to tan, because that's gonna indicate you're gonna have good oxygen penetration in your flock. However, when you see brown to black, that's when the issues start to occur. You're more prone to septic regions forming and low DO filaments forming. Some things that can influence the oxygen penetration is how dense your flock are. The more open flock are gonna be lighter in color typically versus the more dense, it's gonna be darker. The side of the flock plays a factor as well as the surrounding DO levels. And also within flock, we're gonna look at EPS levels. EPS is important because it helps hold flock together. However, you don't want too high or too low of levels. You want a nice moderate level. If your EPS levels are too low, your flock can actually start to break apart because they're weak. However, if you have high levels, that can actually lead to sliming. It's not always, but it can. And another indicator we look at is filamentous bacteria. They're helpful at low levels because they can strengthen flock. However, at higher levels, that's when the issues start to occur, like foaming, bulking, and scum formation. And different types of filaments tend to grow in different spots. Some prefer to grow dominantly inside flock, others within and extending from, and then others just prefer the bulk liquid. Establishing the amount of filaments you have is important, but also what type of filaments is important. 
because if they're causing issues, you can treat that better. Uh, certain filaments prefer certain conditions. So that way, uh, through identification using Gram and Nizer stains, as seen in the photos there, you can better treat those conditions and not just the symptoms from the conditions. A uh, link should be popping up to our filament database where there's a collection of photos and a description for your own use if you have the ability to gram and nize or stain on site. And another indicator we look at is metazoa and protozoa. These guys can help tell us the sludge age. For example, tardigrades, such as in the photo in the bottom left, they'll indicate a higher sludge age. But metazoa and protozoa, they can also indicate other issues or specific conditions. Like in the middle, that's a stock ciliate colony, but they're missing their heads. And that's going to be a sign of unfavorable conditions present, such as myotoxicity. But aside from providing those indicators, metazoa and protozoa are beneficial to you because they actually help in maintaining a clean, clear effluent. And lastly, there are some organisms that don't quite fit into two filaments, metazoa, protozoa, such as free bacteria, zuglia, spiderkeets, tetrads. All of those guys can be indicators to specific situations as well. All right, now Natalie's run through many of the indicators that we look at when we're doing microscopy. These are the things that are going to kind of be our building blocks for figuring out the health of a system or a sample. And once we've done all of our observations and we've looked at all these indicators, then we need to start putting the pieces together into a report. We have a picture on the slide of an example of a page of one of our reports. If you've done reports with us in the past, you probably have a, a good idea of how we structure these, but generally have a number of pictures that we've taken from the sample with a small description there as well. When we're looking at diagnosing something that's going on in a plant, we need to be careful because many indicators, like the one that we've talked about being flock characteristics, EPS, oxygen penetration, filament types, filament abundances, metazole, protozole, all these things can oftentimes indicate or point to multiple different things. And so really you need to look at everything together to get a good, clear picture of what might be going on in the system. And to this effect, there are very few strong indicators where in and of itself, it can tell us something very specific. And many of these are very, or like tardigrades, for example, are one of the few like hard indicators of old sludge age because they're such slow growing organisms but they're fairly rare in as far as indicators go. Another important thing to remember is that, you know, my, the microscopy doesn't lie. I think we've had it multiple times. I think low DO is an example where we'll look at a sample and it'll be filled with low DO conditions and we'll be, hey, you have low DO and we'll hear our aerators are fine, our DO probes are showing adequate DO. And then we'll be like, well, where's your probe? And it'll be like, oh, we got it right above the aerator. It's like, oh, well, it's probably why your DO looks fine, but in reality, your system's experiencing low DO. Now, when we look at building a report and giving recommendations, another thing that we really want to look at is our drivers versus causers. And it's important to think about the fact that at Aquafix, we're a bioaugmentation company. So we're looking to uh, slightly adjust systems to resolve issues. And while you have causers, which are things such as like filaments or flock characteristics, flock health that are directly causing, you know, bulking or foaming or high TSS, there's often a driver behind those causers. And that's what we really want to address. Coming up here, we're going to be going through some examples of the whole picture together and going through a few slides that are gonna give some issues that show up, what indicators we typically see associated with those issues and give you a, a, a bit of an example. Now, I think we do have a poll that we're going to do as well here. It's gonna be, you know, talking about us taking pictures and in, in, in our reports. Um, when you guys do microscopy, do you take pictures? Do you have a micro uh, camera on your microscope? Uh, we're pretty even split. A lot less phones than I thought there would be too. <laughs> All right, yeah, pictures are, are a great way to, to have a like a historical example of what your system looks like, especially if you're doing regular microscopy. It can be a very good log to you know go back and make sure that either treatment's working or just to, to see signs of plant disruption before they're really going to manifest. But let's hop in here. So uh, first example that we have is an old sludge age. You know, if we get a sample that's incredibly old, this can cause 
a number of problems, including like flock disintegration or settling, bulking, any number of things. Oftentimes, Betazole Protozoa are one of our big go-tos as far as indicating old sludge age. We'll, we'll see really large stock stillia colonies. These things take a really long time to grow to a colony that size. So when you see huge ones, you know that your uh, sludge retention time might be a little bit higher than what it should be. Tardigrades as well are very slow growing organisms, slow reproducing. And so seeing them at any significant abundance is, is often going to be a sign that their sludge is a little bit old. But looking at uh, some other things besides metazole protozoa, EPS abundance uh, is, a, is a big one as well as because EPS holds flock together, but it also ends up being a long-term food source when that F to M ratio kind of gets out of whack and you get more microorganisms and you have food. Flock and healthy flock-forming bacteria will often turn towards eating that EPS, and then you'll get a degradation of flock, disintegration rather, and that'll happen kind of from the outside in. So you'll end up having these like low EPS abundances very spherical flock that tend to be a bit smaller in size as well, and high free bacteria as well as flock are disintegrating because of lack of EPS. And these are all good signs, you know, when you see them all together that they're really just dealing with a high sludge age. Another issue that we have on here is nutrient deficiency and imbalance. EPS is a big indicator of nutrient deficiencies or imbalances because while EPS abundance is very important, also EPS characteristics and quality is very important. Uh, EPS is a substance that's made up of, you know, proteins and sugars. And when these ratios get out of sync, you can have qualities of your EPS changing. That's actually where you see like sliming often happens because you have a low protein content in your EPS, but you still have a high EPS abundance. So your flock will get very, have a lot of EPS diffusion and the picture you can see what that looks like. As we see the EPS diffusing out of flock. Oftentimes you'll see a very macroscopically, very viscous looking mixed liquor. that looks very slimy. Filaments are a great indicator for this as well. There's multiple filaments like type 021N and Vegetoa which tend to grow in high abundances in nutrient deficient conditions. And zooglial colonies and zooglial abundances also tend to show up in nutrient imbalances. They're not directly caused by a nutrient imbalance, but they tend to do well in systems that have high simple substrates. And those tend to also be nutrient imbalance. So you see these things kind of come hand in hand. Common nutrient imbalances are, are nitrogen, phosphorus, even simple micronutrients as well, metals sometimes, although much more rarely. Our most common nutrient imbalance that we see will be a nitrogen deficiency though. Now we start kind of getting into the realm of where filaments are going to be doing a bulk of our diagnosis. Filaments at high abundances are a great signifier because they kind of have very morphologies and characteristics and they tend to like different things. So when we look at like overloaded plants, tend to see a lot of symptoms of lots of food, lots of simple sugars. I talked about before Zulu already. That's one that I don't have listed, but that could also be a sign of an overloaded plant. Small open flock, EPS abundance is going to be a little bit low because they're not going to produce EPS as much as they would normally in a, in a healthy loaded plant, you have a ton of free bacteria because there's no need for them to flocculate. And oftentimes in high loaded plants, overloaded plants, you'll see low DO signs. These factors go hand in hand. You have a lot of BOD entering the plant that's going to drive microorganisms to eat. That's going to drive your oxygen down. So you'll also you'll often see low DO signs along with a plant that might just be overloaded. And that's where it kind of gets difficult because you have to figure out like, oh, do you have low DO or are you overloaded? A lot of times the recommendations are similar, but it's important to recognize those specific drivers. Filaments such as S. natans and type 1701 and thiothrix are low DO filaments that tend to show up in overloaded plants. High fat soils and greases. This is a plant type that's very common that we see often and it's pretty cut and dry. Oftentimes manifests as a foam layer that is high in a filament population that enjoys fat soils and greases. Oftentimes filaments are able to bind up those fat soils and greases because of the structure of their cell walls. These are often going to be Nicardi like organisms, NALOs, CM parvicella and type 0092. Sometimes you can actually physically see grease globules if you're looking under the microscope, but oftentimes these aren't present even if you have fat oil and grease issues. And then kind of touch on low DO a little bit. I, I had already mentioned low DO on the previous slide with overloading. 
Um, we do see some additional side effects of low DO when you have low DO as an issue of it in and of itself. Oftentimes you won't get many metazole protozoa. They tend to require a decent amount of uh, dissolved oxygen. Also, you'll see flop coloration is very dark brown, some spots of black under phase contrast. You often see spirochetes and other indicators of low DO. One thing I want to mention about spirochetes is a lot of times we'll see plants that have an anoxic zone or an anaerobic digester leading into the aeration basin. And in those plants, it's totally normal to see a ton of spirochetes. They will carry through your whole system. So while spirochetes are a strong indicator of low DO, it's important to remember to look at your plant structure before you make any diagnoses. And often we have a lot of filaments that show up in low DO. We got some filaments here. Thiophrix, we already talked about S. Natans, H. hydrosis, and Vegetoa. These are all filaments that like low DO. And I said low DO, they don't like zero DO. You typically won't have filaments that grow in anaerobic conditions. That's something that's important to remember. And then we'll take a step uh, kind of beyond the microscope. I already mentioned the spirochetes, and I think that's a good segue into how Knowing the plant process can help us and you identify issues in your plant. I mentioned that anoxic and anaerobic zones leading into aeration zones will carry spirochetes. This is just one example of understanding a plant process or a plant flow and kind of show that that maybe something that could be an indicator in other conditions is actually normal for that situation and necessarily shouldn't consider. Also, when you look at you know, your waste streams, industrial versus municipal, these are very different waste streams. Oftentimes industrial waste is a bit harsher and about a lot more mono-wasted. So you'll typically see more nutrient imbalances and things like that. And also when we're looking at trying to get a plant back to healthy conditions, sometimes that's a, a moving target. Healthy for an industrial plant isn't necessarily the same as healthy for a municipal plant. And lastly, every plant is different. So it's important to remember that what works for you might not work for another plant. I mean, very different biology, even if both plants are functioning well. Just because something works for somebody else doesn't mean that it's going to be the exact same diagnosis or recommendations that, that you get or that it will work for you. Just a quick recap on what we've talked about microscopy. Forming microscopy and by extent film and identification with that microscopy is an invaluable tool for evaluating the health of your system and creating you know, time points. Understanding the drivers behind issues is important for treatment. We need to remember to treat drivers, not causers. And lastly, we need to remember to look at the whole picture. Something I say often is don't miss the forest for the trees. You want to look at all your symptoms and see the larger picture, see those indicators. And we do have a quick question here kind of related to from Cody. Uh, I just want to hop on this one because this one is related to the grease globules, fat cells and greases. Can you explain more about what grease globules are and what this might cause when looking at foaming issues, please? Grease globules are, are going to be very obvious little pockets that you'll see under the microscope. Really, they're just hydrophobic clumps of, you know, fat or grease molecules that are kind of binding together and staying away from everything else. Uh, when I talk about fat cells and greases with foaming, well, ultimately foaming is caused by a disruption of surface tension of the water that then is going to capture air bubbles from your aeration or agitation of the water and produce foam. Oftentimes fat oil and grease foaming we see come from filament overabundances. So like M. parvicella and the cardi-like organisms, they're both organisms that really like fat cells and greases and they have a kind of a hydrophobic cell wall like a fat lipid cell wall that will actually bind to these fat cells and grease molecules and they'll bind them close so that they can eat them preferentially but then by binding them close they'll float to the surface of your basin as well disrupt that surface tension and create foam this is why it's also important to look at your foam microscopically because when this happens you actually get a segregation of uh, nalo and m parvicella in your foam layer and you'll look at your aeration basin and you'll be like oh we got no filaments or aeration basin filaments aren't a problem but if you look at that foam layer you might see nothing but nalo nothing but nicardi like organisms because they're floating to the surface as they capture that fat oil and grease yeah, so now that we've kind of gone over exactly why microanalysis is important and, you know, what key indicators to look for when doing your own microanalysis, I just wanted to go over a little bit about how Aquafix can go about that process for operators and testing your own mix liquor. So as you can see here on your screen, we offer both the microanalysis and filament origins kit, as well as the proactive microanalysis program. Both are really going to be um, similar reports and kind of just going into the individual kits themselves. We'll actually send you out one of these kits here. This is just our standard microanalysis and filament kit. In this kit here, 
will include two sample bottles. One is going to be for mixed liquor. One is going to be for foam. If you don't have any foam, no problem. You can send us two mixed liquors. We also do offer additional bottles as well for multiple sites of testing. Additionally, we now actually offer free return shipping. So we'll include that in the kit as well. And in addition to that, We'll also include ice packs because all of our samples, we do require overnight shipping. Fortunately, the return label there is there to cover that. But we do want to have samples uh, arriving to our facility either on Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. So that in case you happen to send them, you know, maybe on a Thursday or Friday, they don't get held up overnight. They don't get left out, anything like that. We just want to ensure your sample is viable and we can get the best information out of that. So this is just our individual kit. And then if we want to go back to the slide here, Bracket microanalysis program is going to contain four kits. All in all, you get a discount when buying that package. But basically what we'll do once we do receive the samples is we'll take here, we'll take your samples um, in our lab here, we'll write up the report and cover much of the areas they went over early on in this. Anything from phase contrast, staining, identification, and ultimately providing recommendations on that. And as you can see there, that's a detailed list of what else we need. In the proactive microanalysis program, we have the benefit of taking it a step further and offering ATP testing. So we'd be able to track basically how your samples are biologically active going across the board. So if you were to do say a seasonal treatment and do testing in spring, summer, fall, winter, we can give you a comprehensive kind of year long report. And so once again, there's just the kit. Um, we send out the kit to you free of charge. You're not charged until you send, decide to send it back. Um, and once again, really no time is a bad time to sample. Whether your plant's running nicely, you can get a good baseline for a lab should an issue arise, we'll be able to do a compare contrast. Or ultimately, if you do have an issue, really no matter what we often do recommend just sending a kit to get more understanding of exactly what's going on and gain more context. Looks like Don here asked a question, what is the price of the microanalysis kit? Each individual kit, the one I showed you here, this is $400. And then the proactive microanalysis kit is going to be uh, $1,400. And once again, that's a uh, pack of four. So you get a little bit uh, savings value there as well. That's what we got for microanalysis kit. Oh, and here we had another question actually pertaining to that. Um, so Abby asked if we have already ordered the program for test kits, but we have two plants, would we be able to order just additional bottles or do we need to order another program for the second plant? Based on how we operate the proactive microanalysis program and kind of how I touched on the, the ATP testing and how we can do that kind of concurrently throughout multiple reports, I would say it might be beneficial to have that other, other plant do an, a separate proactive microanalysis program. Usually when it comes to additional bottles, we want to make sure all those bottles are going to be coming from one plant alone. So that's uh, pretty much all on our uh, microanalysis program, uh, basically the what's, why's, and how's. And so now we'll move into the question and answering phase. So it looks like we already got some questions here. And once again, feel free to keep the questions coming. We'll do our best job here to get through uh, everybody's. And as always, don't happen to get to your question. You're more than welcome to reach out to us, our technical service reps are always available for free consultation. So without further ado, looks like uh, Clinton here got the first question of the day. And uh, what filaments should I be most concerned about? I would say personally, in my experience in working with operators, really the most trickiest are gonna be any related to high fat oils and greases. Not only do they create poor settling char characteristics, bulking, really low nutrient conditions artificially basically, and then uh, foaming as well. Not only that, but really just the chemical or the biological nature of them. They're very complex. They often bring in a host of other filaments as well. And really just the treatment cycle for them is going to be a lot longer than say something like a low nitrogen filament like uh, O21N where it's just a simple nitrogen addition. And kind of tacking onto that, it depends also on is your plant more susceptible to high incoming fog in that case it would be the concerning filaments would be microsphericks nocardia type 0092 if you're low do that would be more of a hallus colmenobacter hydrosis or an s natin situation so it also kind of just depends on what your system is prone to there's a last little asterisk on that one as well <laughs> all filaments are going to be problematic at high abundances. Just something to remember that if you're seeing more filaments than flock, even if your plant is operating adequately, that's it's going to be a problem. All right. Looks like we have a question from Jeremy. How does your report differ from other labs that do similar microanalysis? So the biggest thing that separates us from other labs is 
we not only provide our observations, but we also put the pieces together for you. Other labs, they'll be like, you have this, 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 and this, here you go, have a good day. And for us, we'll say you have this, 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 and this, but you have this because, and you can do this about it. So that's probably the biggest thing that sets us apart. Yeah, and really to add to that, we also have the ability, We, like I kind of said earlier, we do free consultation. Whomever your rep, whether it's me, Chris, or Josh, we'll follow you every step of the way. Um, should you go about addressing those kind of issues that you, why, as to why you uh, sent in the lab kit, we'll be sure to follow you along the way and answer any and all questions you may have. You know, maybe further testing is needed, that sort of thing. But we'll stick with you until then, until we get it uh, ultimately resolved. Like we have a question from Michael. We are having issues with our digesters. We believe the DO is low. Would your program help in determining if we're overloading or just not enough air being sent to these digesters? We do do microscopy on aerobic digesters. I will hesitantly say yes to your question because I don't know what sort of issues you're encountering. Um, if you want to reach out with more details, we could definitely help you out with figuring, figuring this out. Ultimately, uh, microscopy and a consultation will probably be the direction to go in figuring out how to address the, your issues. Hesitant to say the DO is low, you typically don't need a ton of DO in an aerobic digester. But, like I said, I can't really say more without knowing more details. It could be something too where you can always look upstream. Um, if you do have a you know extended aeration or really any sort of activated sludge upstream, we could always take a look at that, do a microanalysis on that and kind of pull from there and basically use context clues to determine that as well. Um, but definitely Michael and the same goes for everyone in this. Um, if you have any of these unique cases, um, this is something obviously we're very uh, specialized in. Um, so you're more than welcome to reach out to us. All right, looks like Sophia has a three part question. So we'll break this, uh, just tackle it question by question, starting with do all types of foam cause issues? Yes and no. Plants can have foaming and run just fine. It doesn't cause any issues, but then there's uh, situations where a plant can be foaming so bad that it is blowing off onto a nearby highway and causing cars to spin out. Not necessarily the type of foam, it's the amount and if your system is able to handle it. Do either of you have anything to tack onto that part? Uh, yeah, I, I would just say that like foaming is a symptom, right? So just like a, like a common cold, like you would have like sometimes your cough isn't an issue, sometimes it's debilitating, but ultimately it's a signal that there's something deeper happening. And the second part of Sophia's question is what type of foam is the most concerning? If it's causing problems, it's concerning no matter the type. Um, but the one that personally I'd probably be the most uh, worried about is filamentous foaming because that tends to be a little bit more stubborn um, and difficult to treat. But I'll types of foaming can be concerning. It's just a matter of, is it causing problems or not? Yeah, I tend to be more wary of the darker solids foaming. Typically, it's a sign that something a little bit more uh, bad is happening. Your solids are disintegrating or you're losing health in your whole plan. A toxic event might have happened and that that's time to start being a little bit worrisome. And we'll, we'll reference like foaming cut like macroscopically, just looking at foam. You can kind of figure out what kind of foam you have, but it's really not a hard science. So uh, just looking at it, the color of the foam isn't a great way to figure out what kind of foam you have. And the last part is, is it possible for a plant to not have foam? Well, in my experience, uh, I would say not really, you know, no foam at all. Obviously, you know, with any sort of in like an aeration basin, for example, you're going to have a little bit of foam just with the aeration, which is general agitation. Um, and even then, um, you know, like 25% coverage, I would say is not very concerning. Um, but if your plant doesn't have foam, then you're doing great. If your plant even has a little bit of foam, no worries. It's really in the cases where you're getting, you know, 50, 75, and ultimately, you know, 100% coverage and to the point where it's really billowing up, then it's very concerning. But in terms of uh, a plant to not have any foam, I would say very rare, you're going to have just general agitation naturally. Do you have, oh, Richard has a question, do you have a webinar course for identifying filaments? Um, I do not believe we specifically have one for identification of filaments. Um, might be a good idea in the future. What we do have is, um, it was plugged earlier, the database that it shows photos of all of the different common filaments. 
that you can see and it just goes into more detail. But um, as of now, for course, the state said no. Um, in the meantime, hopefully that database could be a help. Yeah, and just to add to that, we don't have any, you know, specific webinars where it cover, covers, you know, all the different types of filaments, but if you do go back on our archives, um, on our website, uh, you can go to, like, say, um, high fats and greases is one of the topics, um, so in that we'll go into, you know, the various filaments associated with that, and same goes for other issues, you know, if it's, um, you know, nitrogen deficiency, it'll most likely have been covered, but ultimately, yeah, I think the, the microorganism, microorganism database is a good way to start, and that's certainly a good idea for a webinar in the future. I have a question from Joshua. What bioaugmentation products would you use to help break down high levels amines in the biomass? Similar question, I would say probably one of our quicksign products would be ideal, um, but also sometimes we can look at other things. We have products that will help make your, your population a bit more robust as well, so that it would maybe assist them themselves in breaking down the amines as opposed to introducing like an enzyme to do that for you. But yeah, I think uh, off the cuff without any more information, probably one of the QuickSign products. Next, we have a question from Alec. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Is microanalysis done for anaerobic digesters? Typically not. We can't really tell you a lot. In digesters, they don't need nearly as much filaments to cause issues as it would in just like a regular aeration basin sample. So unfortunately, that's not something that we really do. Yeah, we do offer some different treatability studies as well, though. We're kind of branching into uh, anaerobic digester studies where we have our own BMP units. We can figure out what sort of gas production you're getting and, and try to uh, help you optimize that gas production as well. Additionally, we can do live dead cell count on anaerobic digesters, uh, which can give like a soft overview of, of what your biomass is looking like in your digester. And to build off of kind of Natalie's response here is, yeah, like she said, any filaments, usually it's going to be in lower quantities and say an aeration basin that would cause an issue, but it's still very rare to see that. Really the only time you're going to see that if you, is if you do have an aeration portion of your wastewater process upstream of things. So in that, in that case, we would simply look to doing, you know, microanalysis in the aer aerated portion of that and ultimately treating that there. Yeah, so we got a question here from Victoria saying, where is the best place to sample for microanalysis? Activated sludge, aerobic, or anaerobic zone? Thanks. Um, well, really, it's a good rule of thumb. The more areas you can sample, the more information you can get out of it. Typically, though, if you're looking at one of our standard kits with just the two bottles, um, we would like to look mainly at the aerated portion of your aeration basin. Um, that's just simply going to offer the most perspective to really give us a grasp on the, the system as a whole. And in addition to that, um, same with the foam. If you do have foam, we can take a look at that um, as well. But that's where we can also get into the flexibility since we do have the two bottles. If you don't have any foam, we could always do maybe a sample of the aeration, the aerated portion of your aeration basin, and then the aerobic or anaerobic and oxic zone, so to speak, as well. Question from Alec or Alloc. Uh, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. What are we supposed to observe in cases of anaerobic digesters? Uh, similar to what we said before, it's really hard to say anaerobic digesters, there's not really much to see. It's generally going to be a big blob of solids. And to that extent, like just using a light microscope, you're not, even with staining, you're not you're not going to really be able to make significant observations microscopically for an anaerobic digester. Michael has a question, uh, bouncing off Victoria's. We have a BLR as well as two aerobic and anoxic zones in our flooring oxidation ditch. Our waste activated sludge that will scent for Asian has an ORP of negative 118. Are you bouncing off of our answer or her question? Um, I guess if you have a question, could you please expand on that? Well, I think the best place to sample. Well, I think kind of going back to that best places to sample, I think largely if you're just looking for a checkup or to get a basis, we want to see your aerobic basin. We can tell the most about your plant in the aerobic system. If we're looking at issues that are happening in your plant, we would want to look at whatever that issue is. So for instance, if you're having foam, we want to get one sample of your mixed liquor in your aeration basin, and then a sample of whatever that foam is. If you're seeing uh, foaming in your aerobic digester, for instance, we want to see a sample from your aeration basin and just the aerobic digester. That's kind of a caveat because you shouldn't have filaments growing in your 
and aerobic digester, they're likely coming from your aeration basin. Rarely will we look at the anoxic zones, just because bio, the biology that's happening in there, in those zones, are not going to be able to tell us like a ton. Most of, you know, most of your removal is happening elsewhere. Um, for your instance, where you have your two aerobic zones and your four ditches, I think if you're just looking for a checkup, just grabbing a sample from each of your aerobic zones would be ideal. Got a question here from Jeremy. Do you offer private or personalized microscopy training? Yes. Uh, if you're ever interested in having one of our team members, you know, either provide you know, hands-on demonstration or even just a kind of small webinar in the form of say a Zoom call or really any kind of any type of training, please reach out to us. We've had experience, you know, working on the industrial private industrial sector, doing training seminars for uh, operators in those company kind of companies. And we've also presented at various different um, conferences, associations, that sort of thing. So if you do have an opportunity for us or any, really any opening for training, this is something we're more than happy to, to facilitate. And we want to throw a poll out there quick, just at the very end here. Uh, maybe how often do you all do microscopy on site? Seems like a pretty good amount of you do microscopy. Just want to see, get a gauge. Seems like weekly is the most common. A lot more dailies than I would have expected. That's good. It's good. Yeah. It's impressive. Yeah. Anytime you can get do a simple sample on for observation, um, it's just taking a quick glimpse at the microscope. It'll tell you a heck of a lot about your plant. And really, the mo the more you can do it, the better, because that's going to tell you exactly. It's going to give you the best picture of the health of your plant. So if you can see any of the indicators we went over earlier, any of the poor indicators, I should say, then it's a then you have the ability to proactively introduce solutions rather than it get too bad. You know, say a filament, you see a spot, small amounts of filaments in your mixed liquor. You have time to get a treatment together and start remediating right then and there. Otherwise, you know, if you say do maybe a monthly analysis or not at all, that's a problem could get significantly worse. And then, you know, before you know it, you have foaming and you have to call us and uh, we kind of have to work backwards basically from there. So anytime you can get sampling and get under the microscope is good. All right, Abby's got a question here. Uh, do you have any recommendations for microscopes with cameras and or tablets? So we use Nikon. Our recommendations would depend on what your goal for analysis is. Some operators have the ability to do more in-depth analysis like stains, so that would require different objectives, but it's best for probably to stick to a name you're familiar with, so like Olympus, Nikon, those kind of things. Um, but demoing, I cannot emphasize that enough. You are definitely going to want to demo, sign up for that demo to make sure it's a good fit for you. But as far as recommendations, it's kind of depending on what you're looking for in specific. Sailor, did you have anything to add? Not too much. I would say I like the microscopes with tablets. Uh, it makes it really easy to take a picture. It kind of adds a bit of user interface friendliness for, you know, kind of cropping or adjusting brightness as well as showing other people what, what you're looking at. A bit easier than using the top-down camera in a traditional microscope lens. Because different cameras have different programs and some of them are a lot more user friendly than others. So we definitely recommend demoing. Okay, another question here. Are there any leading indicators of a filamentous outbreak that operators should be looking for? I would say first and foremost, check on your sludge age. Older sludge ages in a wastewater and an activated sludge wastewater plant you're going to be more susceptible. Um, and furthermore, you should look at, you know, what is your waste stream consistent of? You're going to be a lot more susceptible to something like a Nicardia or a Microthrix, a high FOG filament. If you say have dairy upstream, any sort of food processor upstream, know what's ahead of you and know what you typically treat for. And once again, with the micro analysis package, you can actually do, we'll put together a nice comprehensive visual sludge age representation of, you know, kind of what protozoa meta metazoa do we see that kind of puts you in are you in a young sludge age are you in a good sludge age are you in an older sludge age maintaining that and, and making sure you're in the right area for your plant i would say is going to be the first first and foremost ultimately really then kind of going into once you do have a filamentous outbreak i would say settling is going to be one of the first to go foaming really dependent on the filament once again you're kind of everything upstream view will give you a good kind of sense of of what to you know potentially look out for but i would say foaming settling probably gonna be the biggest two things to look out for
Larry's got a question here. Is there any service where we can just get pictures of the bacteria in the sample rather than a big package? So I would say, I mean, our microanalysis program, just the $400 individual testing, we're going to put the pictures in there with the simple observations and ultimately provide the recommendation. I would say that's going to be your, your best bet. We probably won't ever just do a, a microanalysis where we simply just take pictures and send them on over to you. We want to make sure you get the most out of the samples you send to us and that being the full report that we do. Well, Aubrey has a question on how to measure EPS. Depends how you're measuring it. We typically do uh, the India ink stain, which is a reverse stain. So we'll introduce the India ink, which will be absorbed by everything, but excluded by EPS. And then we can look at that under a light microscope and you know, we'll see uh, spots with EPS will be bright and everything else will be uh, black. And we can use that to kind of determine EPS abundance by how bright those spots are, as well as kind of mapping them over uh, morphology of flock that we've observed without the Indian ink stain. So we can kind of get relative abundances. As far as uh, looking at what composition your EPS is, that's going to largely just come from regular microscopic observation, how it's acting, really as well as looking at other indicators in the sample to kind of see if you have other things pointing towards like maybe a nutrient deficiency that might be influencing your EPS composition. Ooh, I like this question from Matthew. Do y'all have plans on expanding your microbiology database, possibly even a book that can be purchased? So yes, for the first part, we are ever working on expanding and making sure that our database is the most up to date. We've started with just the most common things that we have the most access and knowledge of, but as our knowledge and we start to see new or different things, um, we will add those entries. Um, as of right now, actually, I am working on a section specifically about flock in general. So yes, our database will be expanded, but it may not be as fast as you'd like, but we want to make sure it's the best that it can possibly be. And as for a book, there is nothing in the works, but I will say it is not completely out of the question. So that would be actually really fun to do. So thank you for that. <laughs> Last one, what are the most difficult filaments to identify? It's kind of hard to say, I would say that they're the ones that are atypical. A lot of filaments aren't necessarily single organisms or the same organism. You know, with some sequencing that's kind of come out, we found that you have filaments that are largely up to this point. The reason you call filaments type something is because you're naming them based on which characteristics they're exhibiting and not necessarily naming them after an organism that caught and creates that filament. Uh, we've got a little bit better with sequencing, uh, but for the most part, I think the difficult filaments to identify are those atypical ones, those ones that aren't necessarily cleanly fitting into uh, representing like or manifesting characteristics that are that are easy. Sometimes we see stuff like amylicola, which will kind of stain differently depending on waste stream. It will uh, look different, have like strange cell shapes that might not necessarily be nice. For me, that that's probably the more difficult one to identify. I agree. It's definitely those filaments that have the weird staining characteristics that are damaged. Um, for example, microthrix, you, it'll stain gram positive, and then they'll have nicer negative granules, and that nicer stain is kind of just a uh, confirmation that it is the, this is this filament. But if it's been exposed to anaerobic conditions, it'll lose those granules. And while that still is a somewhat easy filament to identify even without those granules, um, definitely the ones that are damaged and just weird. Thank you everybody for, for coming and joining us for the webinar and asking questions, a lot of great questions. If you have any other questions that you know you think of later, don't hesitate to reach out, contact Tyler and he'll get you in touch with us. Thank you.